My name is uh, Helena Hadella and I'm a local artist here in Calgary and born and raised in Calgary, Alberta. I'm a graduate of the University of Calgary in a fine arts department. And uh, my forte is painting and uh, mixed media collage work as well as printmaking. So I studied printmaking in my undergraduate years and got to uh, go to Japan after I graduated in 1975. And I was very fortunate to meet Toshi Yoshida in Japan. He had a studio in Tokyo as well as a studio at uh, Miyasa Bunka Center in Nagano-ken. And so he invited me to come to the Bunka Center to study, uh, study Japanese woodcut. So I was very fortunate to do that. Um, for several months I learned the technique of ukiyo-e. So uh, you will see in the video here some of the uh, part of the process for um, creating a, a woodcut print. And I, uh, I hope it's informative. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, the first uh, step in uh, making a Japanese woodcut. So you would take uh, any kind of wood would work. I've done this on Canadian cedar wood. Uh, this, this is a traditional block that would have been used by someone like Hiroshige or Toshi Yoshida. They love to use uh, cherry wood because it really lends itself to many impressions and it doesn't break down. But uh, for our purposes, this uh, Shina wood is absolutely perfect. This is imported from Japan and it's uh, basswood, poplar. Basswood is poplar and it's uh, laminated, laminated uh, plywood. So it makes it very strong. It doesn't uh, buckle or curve and you can also carve on the back side. You can carve on both sides. So you take your... Uh, you take your image and then you draw out your image onto the block and the uh, most important thing is to carve a registration uh, mark here in one corner for where your paper uh, goes and another mark here to guide it so you have equal margins every time you print. It also helps you to uh, control the printing process when it comes to doing multiples uh, with color but we'll talk to that about that later. So this is a block that a small image that was carved uh, using these kind of tools and these are traditional Japanese ukiyo-e woodcut tools and they are very specialized and um, they're incredible. They're almost on they're on par to Japanese samurai sword making the quality of the tools is really incredible. So they have a softer metal and a harder metal that's um, fused together to create flexibility but strength. And this is probably the most important tool for traditional ukiyo-e uh, to create a, a very refined edge. And uh, these two pieces are the first ones that I carved when I was uh, living in Japan at the Miyasa Bunka Center studying under Toshi Yoshida. So I had a block of wood and I used only this tool to create, um, to create these images. So you would cut away the wood where you want the white paper to be and your image is actually defined by uh, the relief. So what is uh, the highest on your block is what's going to print and what you carve away is what's going to be the empty area. So this tool was used to um, create the lines uh, to make these particular images. And there's uh, a lot of different kinds of tools. There's a kind of um, the U-shaped tool. These are very very refined uh, detailed tools for detailed work and I think that's the smallest one that I have here and uh, that would make a very very fine line a very fine groove in your in your 
wood wood matrix. Another type of tool, I think it's the Sanka Kuto, it's all coming back to me now, uh, a V-shaped tool. And uh, this gives you very, very fine lines. This is probably what the, you would use to create, uh, you know, um, the detailed uh, lines in, in someone's hair, for example. Uh, so that's, uh, and then these tools are quite wonderful because they come apart and um, and to sharpen them, you can you just take them out of the holder, and you can sharpen these. There's a specialized uh, whetstone that you use to sharpen the the tools, and you have to be very careful just to get the right angle at them of them. And uh, they have a amazing longevity because that's quite a lot of tool left there um, that can be used for years to come so it fits beautifully into the holder and then the little metal piece goes over top like that to hold it in place and then you hold it in your hand like so and I probably would have carved these very fine lines that you see in the leaves with this uh, v-shaped tool and then this this uh, these lines here would have been um, the gouge just called a gouge uh, and uh, it, it's actually a U-shaped kind of tool that clears away large, large areas, but you get a very expressive line when you're when you're carving. Um, and then, so those are the tools for for smaller images. And then, if you want to make a larger image, there's these uh, uh, much larger scaled uh, tools. So this one is very similar uh, to this one here, but has a much uh, wider um, wider surface area, so you can really clear away a lot of um, a lot of wood with a large tool like that. And this is also a great tool for clearing away margins on a on a large scale block. Okay, so. Um, it's pretty straightforward to, uh, and it's a really enjoyable um, thing to do is to carve into the wood. I really love the, the feeling of, of uh, creating an image by carving into the wood. And of course you want to clear away your margin area so that you get a nice clean, nice clean margin when you're printing. Okay, so uh, now we can move on to um, talk about color. So I'd like to introduce you to the uh, process of creating a Japanese ukiyo-e uh, multicolored print. So this is uh, the next step in printmaking. Once uh, you try out a black and white print, the next um, step is to uh, perhaps integrate uh, color and all the wonderful uh, nuances that Japanese would cut brings with uh, the printing process to create a color image. So here, uh, this, th these are just uh, small illustrations that I did when I was teaching Japanese woodcut at the College of Art, uh, which is Alberta University of the Arts now. And uh, that's just a small carving and I'm uh, uh, appropriating a D Edward Degas image here. And I carved that into a block and just printed it in uh, with black ink just to illustrate what a one color woodcut looks like. So then to uh, add color to the woodcut, um, this would this was um, a block that's you have to cut the margins away and make it exactly the same size as your uh, original image. And you also on your block want to make sure that you have the the kento mark, this mark that's in the corner of, of your block that uh, holds the paper, and that's really the, the key to creating multiple images because your paper goes into that slot every single time. So you, you would use the same piece of paper uh, to, um, to print uh, your final image, um, but you have multiple blocks that you need to carve um, for each color. So each color needs its own special block. So in this case here, uh, I printed just the one color. So this is a block I had to carve. 
uh, leaving the whole surface, uh, but just carving out the margins. And um, so this block was used uh, uh, separately to create the color. So uh, a, a good uh, example of that is uh, this particular block. This is my, one of my first uh, color wood, wood cut that I did when I was living in Japan, studying under Toshi Yoshida. It's called the Stone Garden, and it's, I'm sure you'll recognize it. It's a very famous uh, meditation garden in, in Kyoto, and it's, uh, it's called Ryuanji. And I um, decided to use the, uh, the, stone, the stone configuration here to create my first woodcut. So to create this particular woodcut, I had to carve seven plates. And you can see them here, uh, all seven of them. So the key block is um, the ones with the, with, with the lines that holds the structure of the of, of the image. So that's your key block and so that's carved. So this was printed with black to get this imagery. And then this one is the, the dark um, the dark brown uh, color and to get the texture in the stone. So this is uh, the next block that was carved to make this image. Uh, then this, this is uh, a very subtle um, color in the um, in the in the in the ground area here, so this block is a, a light, light brown color. Then um, to do the roof top here, this is the the wood cut that was used to create this uh, burnt sienna color at the top. As you can see, each uh, each one. So I would use the same piece of paper but uh, place it on every individual block for each color. Uh, here too we have the green and the, gra and the grass uh, showing through on, on, this, on this particular block. Also uh, this band here to darken, darken the roof line. Then this last one here is the lighter, uh, the lighter green that you find in the rock, in the rock shapes. So I created 15, uh, an addition of 15 of these on, uh, on a very beautiful handmade um, Kozo paper that's specifically um, manufactured to, to create Japanese woodcut. So hopefully that shows you what it entails to create a color image. Uh, there's a lot of finesse that can be um, used in Japanese woodcut. So you can print, this is an example, bokashi, and um, you, can, you can print soft edges as well, so gradations, so very famous. Uh, Jap uh, Japanese ukiyo-e is very famous for its, uh, for its bokashi. And you can put many layers of bokashi and create beautiful sense of depth in your image by using that printing technique. So I'm preparing some rice paste here for the printing process and I put a little Yamato. This is the rice paste that we use is called Yamato sticking paste and you put a little in the bowl and add a bit of water just to make it a kind of a, almost like a mayonnaise kind of consistency in your bowl. And so you need that. You also need uh, a little bit of black ink, Chinese ink, or this is particularly um, Japanese ink, which is uh, very nice quality for, for, pr for printing. And put a little in the bowl. And use a little brush with a short stick like that so it's easy to handle. So maybe I'll talk a little bit about the Baron. This is a very, very clever, um, clever invention. In the center, you have a, a smaller diameter, and it it, it um, gets larger as you go along the edge. And it's also got uh, this. Actually, is one that Toshi had made for me, and it's all braided fish line, all glued in a in a spiral shape. So it's really a very special baron. And we have actually 
barons here for like student use um, that one of my uh, mentors uh, also uh, uh, his Japanese Canadian Noboro Sawai who used to teach uh, woodcut at the university he actually um, designed these and had these manufactured so to replicate you can't see the the beautiful fish braided fishing um, line here in mind because it's covered with the bamboo sheath. But just for uh, student purposes, this uh, works really well. So um, Noboro had these uh, little discs created, plastic discs with the little, so you can see the little points of each dot there is what uh, uh, gives you the pressure on the block to, to do the print. And then just uh, very difficult these days to get bamboo sheaths to, that cover the barren. So we're just using uh, this kind of a mylar plastic and creating a little handle. So it doesn't look very pretty, but it actually works quite well. And uh, I have a, actually a, an extra bamboo sheath here that just to show you the beautiful natural materials that were used for the Japanese woodcut techniques. So you would, if you, your baron has worn out, you would take one of these and soak it for uh, several hours, uh, rolled up in a towel till it gets beautifully soft and pliable. Like right now, it uh, has been sitting in the dry air, so it's quite stiff and hard. But uh, when you're ready to recover your baron, you would just wrap this in a, in a towel and it would soften, but it's very strong. It also has these beautiful ridges along there that you would use the back of uh, Japanese scissors to take out and to flatten this whole surface. But it's a very, very strong. I've had this for several years now and it hasn't worn out. So they're a fantastic material, so bamboo sheath. And a way to prepare a better quality washi paper is to score it and just tear. You never cut with the mat knife or scissors. Okay, so the other seven and a half by quarters by seven. It's going to be square by seven. Scoring. I said a kind of an owl type of tool. Get a, an even mist. We have to do this in Calgary because it's very, very dry here. So preparing the paper just so that it gets moist. And then you just put it in between dry sheets and let that excess moisture come out. And do that a few times because you don't want to have your paper too wet. Then you won't get uh, you'll get very blurry edges if the paper is wet. So we just want it damp, but uniformly damp, so I can see it's just a bit dry over there. We're gonna just let that for a little bit. I would have my newspaper dampened in this box and I would soak my paper for about half an hour, the heavier weight Torinoco paper, and then it would go in this box between the damp newspapers or blotters and I would close it overnight so it would be ready for printing the next morning. You usually would do that for a color if you're doing color because it's so important to have your paper just perfectly damp for the printing process. Okay, so I'm just putting it in some dry uh, and we're gonna let it sit for a little bit. Paper, this is a good quality uh, Torinoco, handmade Torinoco paper. So uh, we wanna get it just the right 
dampness. So we want it damp but not wet. And I think we'll put it back into dry sheets here and rub it. So the very special quality of Japanese printmaking is the fact that the pigment goes into the wood. The, the wood. It, uh, in Western style printmaking, the ink sits right on, is rollered right onto the top of the block, whereas Japanese, uh, there's a lot more finesse to the printing process, but uh, much more nuance is created by the fact that the pigment goes right into the, the, the fibers of the wood. Rubbing it from the back just a couple more times. And I also have to consider the time it will take me to add pigment to the, to the block. And there's a, usually a front side and a back side. The front side has got a slight shine to it or a sheen to it. And uh, also you want to have an edge that is um, kind of a square, uh, ge geometric hard edge rather than the, the, the soft edge of the paper where it's obviously a handmade sheet of paper so it's got the deckle edge on one side. But to fit in my registration, uh, I will use this edge to fit into the corner of the wood there. Okay, so now I'm going to prepare the block. I'm going to bring some Japanese Sumi ink to the block just enough to get it moist and I'm adding a bit of the rice paste to use as a binder. And I'm going to uh, add some pigment to to the block and because my paper is moist I want to be very careful about how much ink is on the block. You want just enough for the wood to absorb the ink but not to be pooling in, in, the, uh, in the lines that you've carved for your image. Otherwise, it'll bleed on the oriental paper. Okay, and then I'm gonna go one direction and then another direction. And the last one against the grain. Okay, so now I'm gonna take my, my paper. And a great way to handle your paper is putting it between your fingers like that. And then with your thumb, you can guide it into the registration. Mark and oops, gotta get it in there. Oh my, that's windy. Okay, and I'm just gonna drop it onto the block. And since it's a damp, delicate piece of oriental paper, I'm gonna put uh, some newsprint on the back of it and take my bar in. You can kind of peek and see, hopefully, that. If pigment's coming through just gradually, that means it's just the right amount to create a nice impression, but not bleed. And just perfectly soaked up by the paper. And you can also sometimes, if you want, just peek and see. Oh, I think we're getting a very nice impression there. And do one more light rub with the barn. And let's see how that worked out. We pulled it out. Oh, that turned out very nicely. Okay. So that was just the perfect dampness for the paper to take the ink and not pool, but give a nice dark impression. So, it really helps to use a good quality paper. <laughs> so, one of my 1982 Japanese style woodcuts entitled Counter, installed in 2019, has been selected from the City of Calgary's collection and the Civic collection I reproduced on a bus shelter for the Max Orange line. 
The image is featured at the Saddle Dome Circle location in northeast Calgary. Also, another one will be uh, posted at the cancer, when the cancer center is completed. The image will be featured at the Foothills Medical Center, Max Orange Line Bus Shelter, alongside a clay print by Marion Nichol. I think that's a very beautiful, very beautiful idea. And thanks to the city of Calgary. Okay.